I see I'm not going to get any traction with getting you to move forward. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, we'll proceed. Right, so we're about to get into the neuroscience of things. Uh, up next, our next speaker is Travis, who's going to be talking to us about always be delivering. And we're going to be getting to the neuroscience of just-in-time uh, delivery. Just a little bit about uh, Travis. Travis is a team lead at Chilisoft. He's got a master's in software engineering, as well as a leadership coaching certificate from this neuro, neuro leadership group. He's passionate about innovation, as well as changing the world. Please help me welcome Travis. Thanks everybody for coming, I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Cool, so always be delivering. Uh, it's about setting expectation, and that's what I've done with the title here. Uh, you know, you want to get the team to be as efficient as possible, and we're going to look at the neurological principles behind how we did some process innovation within the Agile space at Chilisoft. If you want to follow me on Twitter, is, you can. Don't really tweet much. Probably tweet my slide deck. So let's get into an overview of what we're going to be covering. So I'm going to set the stage by giving you some context, like how we came to come across this weird neural neural lean experimentation we, we were doing. Uh, before we get to the experimentation, we're going to cover the brain in brief. We're going to just go through some basic neurological principles. So everyone's got a, an understanding of how the brain works. Uh, we'll get into some neural leadership principles. David Rock, uh, the guy who created the neural leadership concept, he's got some really interesting ideas. Uh, then in the neural lean experimentation, is what I'm, we're calling it. And finally, the ABD principles, uh, always be doing, delivering principles, the things we've managed to distill out of this whole crazy experiment, which we're still using and still delivering on. So context, uh, charge of a pretty small team. Chilisoft's not a big organization. There's about 30 people. Um, only about 16 of us actually do development. Uh, so, you know, it's an interesting challenge. We've, we're a small team and we've got nine responsibilities. So, effectively, we could have nine Kanban boards because we use Kanban boards, we like visual management, and spend half a day scrumming around various Kanban boards. Uh, or we could come up with a different way of kind of representing uh, our Kanban boards such that, you know, all these responsibilities showed up. It's kind of the journey of what we, we've done. Uh, and, you know, while we're kind of playing around with traditional Kanban, let's, let's use some science. Let's do science-based process innovation. Uh, one of the things, one of the responsibilities I, I look after is innovation within ChiliSoft. Um, a lot of business model canvases, value proposition canvases, lean dashboards, pirate reports, all that fun stuff. Other things are like PR and marketing. Uh, we do do software development every now and again. Um, <laughs> Um, and we, you know, we needed to be low friction, because in addition to managing a team, I needed to deliver with the team. So the, the neuroscience side is going to cover two, two aspects. We're going to look at neuroanatomy, so kind of how does the brain function in, on its own? And neuroleadership, how does the brain function when it's more of a social context? You have a whole bunch of brains working together. We always talk about people, but you know, I, I feel we tend to overlook the, the, the brain side of that that's driving that person to interact and engage the way they do. So the brain. Well, let's look at a quote from a, a pretty famous uh, neuroscientist. I'm really not going to try to pronounce his surname. I tried at work when I went through this on Friday and I got laughed at. So, How can three pounds, a three pound mass of jelly that you hold in your palm imagine angels, contemplate the meaning of infinity, and even question its own place in the cosmos? You know, it's, it's three pounds of jelly. It's not just the person. It's this, this three pounds of goo that's driving us, giving us emotions, helping us make decisions. That's the real thing behind the person. So we're going to talk about two systems. The first system is the limbic system. It's the primitive uh, portion of the brain. It's called, we're calling it system one. It's the first system we're going to discuss. And it's responsible for our emotions. The primary... Uh, component of the Olympic system, or system one, is the, uh, the amygdala. It's kind of an almond-shaped region of the brain stuck in the middle. <clears throat> the second system, system two, is the prefrontal cortex. This is a thin slice of the brain in the front. This is the thing that allows us to make decisions, allows software developers to do abstract thinking. Um, it's kind of the executive control center. It's the one mitigating your emotions. So your system one and system two, there's always a balance between the two. Generally, your system two is in control. 
it's the one that's responsible for making sure that we, we all are a cohesive society, not uh, a bunch of silly people running around. And the interesting thing about it is it uses glucose as fuels. And it's got a really tiny fuel tank. So you, you, you see silly things like the President of uh, the United States of America always wearing the same suit. Well, he does that because it's one less decision he has to make. That's one last little hit he's got to take out of his, his glucose fuel tank. Typically, your system two is in charge and driving things, but every now and again, your system one will flare up. And this is, this is what we call an amygdala hijack. It's responsible for the fight, flight, or freeze reaction. So in a survival scenario, you're going to have typically a fight or flight, or some people, a freeze reaction, make a decision between the two. It shuts down your system two, so you can't make bad decisions. So an amygdala hijack, it's, it's an interesting um, scenario. It kind of goes something like this. So let's pretend I'm, I'm a caveman. I'm coming out of my cave. I'm having a big old stretch in the sunshine. Oh, it's a wonderful morning, looking around. And I'm running. And I'm running. Well, what, what's happened is that my visual processing, my eyes, and the other areas of my brain involved in actually understanding that information, caught a saber-toothed tiger eyeing me up in the grass. He's like, hey. <laughs> so my survival instincts kicked in, and I just took off. And it's before I even visually can understand that it's there. My, my, bar, my brain is engaged. It's scanning. It's making sure that I detect threats. I react to those threats appropriately. So if anyone plays games and they've heard the term rage quit, this is exactly what's happened. You've had an amygdala hijack. Suddenly, you, you're not thinking straight. You're, out, you're lashing out. So that, that covers a little of the neuroanatomy. Uh, we're going to look at a uh, SCARF model. And this is where the neural leadership stuff comes in. Uh, SCARF's uh, an interesting concept. <clears throat> in each letter stands for a different thing. And individuals are driven by one, sometimes two, of these, these concepts. So status. Status is the first one. Status is around how, as individuals, um, we show up. In the agile context, it's a bit more, not necessarily what role you hold, but maybe you're that guy that can always deliver lots of points. Or no, you're that guy that does that, that cool thing. You're showing up in the team. Then there's certainty. Certainty is around understanding that what I think is going to happen is going to happen. So it's a bit of an interesting one with certainty, because we're all to some degree affected by certainty. That, that system two, that prefrontal cortex, is a giant prediction machine. It's always trying to predict what things are going to look like. The reason is, is that you have approximately 120 bits of uh, cognitive bandwidth. And out of that, 60 bits are used for visual processing. Now, what the brain is doing is it's trying to predict where things, the reality that you're perceiving is going to be, taking that visual input, effectively diffing the two, and sending that back to the rest of your brain to understand what reality should be represented as. So when things when, when our certainty isn't met, we, the brain goes a bit haywire. It's, it's, it, works, uh, extra, it works overtime to try to figure out where the difference is, how, how this can be. Autonomy. This is the, the desire to kind of be your own person. You know, in a, in a teamwork kind of setting, it can be a bit challenging to cater to people with an autonomy driver, people who want to feel a little bit more of their own person. Then there's relatedness. This is really about co-creation, like each uh, people working together. Uh, my colleague Brendan is a high related disc driver, and uh, because of that, he tends to engage verbally a lot. He likes to talk. Uh, <laughs> he also has a high certainty driver, which makes it quite interesting. <laughs> uh, then there's fairness. This is around the rules being followed, and everyone's going to follow those rules. So in social context, these are the things that are driving our interactions. You know, I, I personally have a status and certainty driver, so I don't like it when what I thought was reality gets shifted. So, you know, neurological stuff's all great, but you've got to have a good, solid technical foundation to work from at the end of the day. And chili stuff's quite unique in that, you know, when you've really taken a lot of these principles that you would say are underneath the um, uh, agile banners, threw them all into a big old cauldron, stirred them up, and pulled out the things that, that actually work for us. So we'll see things like TDD. Uh, we're all pretty much contractually obligated to practice TDD. Uh, it was an part of an organizational transformation. It's a great practice. We believe in it. 
Um, I don't think any of this process innovation would be possible if we didn't actually do test-driven development. Paired programming, another, another uh, practice that at ChiliSoft we take a lot of value in. You know, it's not about just writing code, it's about problem solving. You know, whether that's two people or more of this mob programming concept, multiple people working together to try to solve the issue at hand. Uh, we've got CI servers, so we're running our builds, we're making sure that our, our tests are passing, there's no issues there. We've even got a, a strip of build lights that go um, red if the build breaks. Daily stand-ups in visual management, where we've got a Kanban board, we all get together as a team, we talk around what work we're doing, what work we did yesterday. Um, and quality work. You know, everything we do ha has an eye towards quality. We don't believe in producing things that are, well, we don't being, believe in being reckless in producing things that uh, produce technical debt. And one of the more interesting things that's quite unique to our team, not necessarily a value of ChiliSoft, is the, is the concept of approaching everything top-down. Not top-down management, but just looking at the problem top-down, trying to come in from the top and figure out how to solve it. And that's important to this concept of ABD being able to move things forward. Because if we're deep down in the technical details, you can't really expose that to a client, to another guy on the team. Well, maybe if you look at the code, but you can't expose it in the system. You can't really have a valuable conversation around what's happening. So let's talk a bit about Kanban boards. Who uses a Kanban board? Cool, most people. All right, so two key principles of Kanban boards. You're going to look, limit work in progress, so you don't have a team of five guys with 30 things and nothing's ever getting done because you're always trying to work a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit everywhere. And the other thing is that you're always pulling from column to column. The flow is in one direction. It should never go backwards. It should always move towards the done column. So this is a real basic Kanban board with a queue, work in progress, and done. So this is a concept uh, we, didn't dis like we didn't ourselves uh, create. We discovered on some tech tourism. But it was the first win for us in taking these neurological principles and applying them to the way we work. We call it R2L for L2R people. And initially, it started off as a concept of inverting your board to the direction you read. So if you read left to right, invert your board so that it goes the opposite direction, right to left. It has two things that it does, at least in the beginning of 30 days until this becomes a bit of a habit, is it's overriding your system one. So nobody knew how to walk when they were born. We all had to learn that behavior. And now we don't think about walking. It's an automated thing we do. That's been pushed down to our system one. It's just something we can, we can work through. We don't even have to worry about it. Um, the problem is, is that when you're doing automated behaviors, you're not as observant as you would be if you're doing something you're still learning. So by inverting the board, we're, we're overriding the system one behavior, and we're activating our system two behavior. So we're activating our threat detection, or in this case, maybe anomaly detection would be a better way of putting it. The other, adva well, the other advantage is once it's become a bit of a habit, once it's kind of reseeded back down into that system one, you're always starting with the most important thing of the day. Um. It doesn't seem like the clicker's working anymore. The light's on, but... Oh, there's an issue. Uh, you have... Okay, hold on. Sorry about the technical fault. There was a little message on the screen. And there we go, we're back. Cool, so, you know, <laughs> building on the success we had with... Uh, with just tweaking our board slightly, being able to align it to some neurological principles, we're like, cool. You know, since we're looking after nine different things with four guys, whip limits are going to be a bit of a problem, especially considering we've got some things related to non-technical, some things related to development, some things related to supporting some more legacy systems we have. It's a bit of a problem if you pull something in for support, you get a hold of the client, like, ah, you know, it's a bit of an issue. Let's park it for another week. Well, what do you do? You got something occupying your whip column. Beyond that, uh, previous uh, employers, you know, really getting new to agile, 
And it's something I've seen before. People learn how to game the whip limits. So let's say you've got a whip limit of four, and because you, you've got four guys, it's full, there's an issue, it really needs to be solved. The guy will go off and tackle the issue, he'll wait for a spot, bang it through, done. The work's taken care of. What's, what, well, that's nice, but your board's not reflecting reality. You don't really know what's going on. You know, you're, you're losing information that's quite valuable to, to managing the team. So typical scenario, is, we see this a lot. Um, whether you have whip limits or not, you're in a stand up, you know, the guy stand there, pulls in feature two, he works on it, he works on it, he works on it. The next day at the stand up, he's like, you kinda, something semi-coherent, you kind of get a sense of where he's going. Day three, day four, day five, maybe it's, maybe it's moved to done. Maybe you can see it actually complete. Well, that's, that's, that's cool, but you know, you don't know what actual value he's delivering. You don't know, he may tell you if he has an issue or two. He may not be aware that he has an issue. You know, at some point that's gonna move through to done and you know, that'll be cool. We can move on to the next piece of work. So we decided to go back and look at the, the lean principles. And there's, a, there's an interesting lean principle in there and it's around deferring commitment. So we're like, okay, we've got this, this issue with whip limits. And we've got this principle sitting over here um, called well, deferring commitment. We're like, okay, you know, deferring commitment's nice, but you know, how do you defer commitment to the last responsible moment? Like, you know, software developers will always kind of do a little hand wavy, dance around the issue kind of thing. So we went out looking, and you know, the Navy SEALs have this interesting principle called the 70-30 rule. And this, you know, this is life and death kind of situations. They need to defer to the last responsible moment to make decisions. And the 70-30 rule is you need to be 70% certain that you're going to make the right decision, that you're informed enough to go ahead and make that action. If you wait any longer, you may up, end up in a really unfortunate situation where lives are at risk. And if you go any sooner, you may not have enough information to make the right decision. So we're like, okay, it is possible. You can actually go ahead and defer commitment. We're like, okay, cool, so we're deferring commitment, but how do we prioritize things? How do we know what's important, what's not important, what we should be doing when and where? So we went and uh, found this thing called the Eisenhower Task Matrix. It's quite a unique um, four-quadrant matrix. And what's unique about it is that Eisenhower was he's quite an efficiency Nazi. He was a World War II, well, that's probably a bad term, because he was a World War II uh, <laughs> general. <laughs> And he was president of the United States. He was, he was quite obsessed with getting th things done quickly and as simply as possible. So a quick look at his matrix. There's an axis for important and there's an axis for urgent. And he's quoted as saying, often what's urgent isn't important and what's important isn't urgent. So this helps us make decisions on a day-by-day -day basis when we're going through a board, what work to actually take in. We've deferred you know, certain things. We're trying to you know, be good about this. So, if it's urgent and important, you got to do it now. It just it can't wait. You know, maybe this is a critical bug. Like it's got to get prioritized in, in ahead of feature development. Do it. Cool. You know, something that's important but not urgent. Well, okay. You know, we need to do it. We can figure out. You know, maybe in two weeks' time we can slot it into the system. We don't use sprints, iterations, any of that because it's kind of an expectation that the guys are delivering every single day. Um, there's a nice one. Delegate. Everyone could be better at delegation. So it's, it's built into our decisioning matrix, which, which is really nice because, you know, especially when we have some of these more uh, edge case responsibilities like PR and marketing or innovation, there are other people in the company who we can give some of these tasks to. We don't have to run the task all by ourselves. So it's nice to know that we've, we've got something built into our decision making process that's going to force us to improve and be better. And the, the do it later quadrant, this, this is always interesting because we actually find it's a drop it quadrant. We've got, we've, we've got into certain pieces of work, we're like, oh, this is going to be an important issue, and da, 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 da. And as we get into the work, we find that actually this isn't important. We're going to just throw it away. Get rid of it. Less work to do. It's amazing. We can still deliver the whole feature in this thing that we really thought we needed to do. We don't. And f for me, I attribute that to the fact that we're coming in from the top. We're not coming up from the bottom. We're really seeing the whole value stream as we, we come down. So this leads us to a very interesting concept called sticky refactoring. 
So for us, you know, we want to avoid these five, six, even two, three days of not really knowing exactly what's going on in a piece of work. For us, it's about delivering daily value, so extracting the value out of the work that you're delivering and talking about it, which gives us excellent talking points at the stand-up. Because the interesting thing about System 1 and System 2 is that emotions are contagious. So if, if Fred's a little nervous to stand up because, you know, he maybe just can't remember what he's doing, or he's just a little more introverted, you know, or maybe he didn't have a good day and he doesn't really want to talk about it. His, his, his emotional state is going to be contagious. His, his, his amygdala isn't going to hijack, but it's going to start polluting his system too. The effect of this is, is that his IQ is dropping. Not only is his IQ dropping, the entire team's IQ is dropping, because they're picking up on this. So, oh, like a yawn. It's contagious. You know? It, it, you're, you're driving down the efficiency and the ability of your team to perform. So by, by creating talking points, we create a safer space. We, we, it's really easy. Just talk about what you did. If you didn't finish it, that's OK. We can, we can now start to visualize and understand what's happening. The nice thing is that you know, we're all visual learners, whether we believe it or not, because half the cognitive bandwidth we have is devoted to visual processing. So being able to visualize just adds an extra depth to understanding. And because we're, we're doing it every day, we can pick up issues quicker. We call them rabbit holes. It helps avoid those deep, dark places in the code that you get stuck. So how does sticky refactoring work? Well, I pull something into WIP, so I got feature six. Cool, I'm going to work on it, I'm going to work on it, I'm going to work on it. The next day it comes around. Well, I couldn't finish it, but I discovered these three things about it. You know, there's actually three pieces, I can say, in, in for delivering this feature. Whether that's, you know, a login screen or uh, data access or whatever, whatever it, form it takes. And I can go, cool, well, based on what I know now, I can say, I delivered feature 6A. I managed to get this piece done so we can have a conversation about it. Maybe we can get it into the client's hands and give us some feedback. We can understand if we're on the right track and go forward. Well, I've got these other two things here now. What do, what do I do with them? Well, we have a discussion. We go, well, you know, 6C isn't that important. We can actually, we can put that out until after we get this next release out. So we're going to prioritize it below this date. And that's a technique we found very useful with all these various columns uh, or backlogs, whatever you want to call them, in our Kanban board. It's just using dates to do some basic project management. We know this needs to be delivered by this date. Anything below can be delivered later, which is really good for competing priorities and trying to, to manage that as a whole. And we go, OK, 6B, well, you know, let's, let's do that today. We think that's really important. Like if the client's expecting a new release with at least this set of the features, Let's do it. It's not about just extracting value and not having a conversation with your client. You really should be engaging with them and saying, hey, look, I understand feature six was on the books. We've got most of it in. We, you know, the deadline's coming up. We wanted to get some feature one work done, too. This is the scenario. So not only does it create conversations with the stand-up, it creates opportune moments to have conversations with your clients or product owner. So just a quick example of feature six. C being deprioritized with the matrix. It's in the important but not urgent column, so we've decided to do it later. We deprioritized it below the date. So if you've seen my colleague Brendan's talk about uh, technical debt, you would have heard the term red bin. Red bin comes from lean manufacturing. It's literally just a giant red bin that sits behind the operator. And is a, if a defective part comes through, he takes it off and puts it in the bin. In the next day or two, everyone gets together and understands why this defect occurred and what we can do in the process to avoid it happening again. So sprints kind of offer this in the fact that maybe every two weeks, a week, a month, whatever your cycle is, you can go and retrospect around what the issues were. We felt that wasn't good enough. We wanted some way of representing a process issue much quicker. I'm going to use technical debt slightly differently than what most people would understand it, but I'll explain it. So let's say at the stand-up, Pull feature three in, I work on it, I work on it, I work on it, I work on it. The next day it comes around, and I can't do anything. I can't extract any value out of it. Oh, no. Well, it turns red. We, we literally put a red sticky on the board to represent that. What's happened is it's representing a process fault. It's telling us there's an issue, and that we need to maybe pair up or, as a team, come in and understand what the issue is, what's holding this up. So for us, red bins represent learning. Whether that's learning in the domain, learning at a technical level, red bins are all about learning. And we, we know that 
you know, if, if we love our, our technical debt, that's, who, that's our general term for them, that we're going to care about it. And when we care about it, we're going to make sure it's taken care of. And by taking care of it, we're going to make sure it's not an issue next time when you go into, the area, into that area of the system and do work. So why does this work? You know, I just said you can game with limits and this and that. Well, I'm sure some of you have heard of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Uh, quite an interesting experiment at Stanford where students were taken and given the opportunity to be a prisoner or a guard. And within a matter of a day or two, probably about a day, uh, they started descending into these roles. So guards acted as guards and prisoners acted like prisoners. Though just a couple days before, there were classmates sitting next to each other in class. That expectation had been set, and they delivered on that expectation. This is why placebos work. It's the power of suggestion. The mind's an incredibly powerful thing. So what can we actually distill out of this whole set of experiments, these ideas? Well, our first principle is the board must reflect reality no matter how much it sucks. So. We got a quote from David Rock here. Uh, when the craving for certainty is met, there's a sensation of reward. And that certainty is that there's not a cognitive dissonance between what I know or I think I'm going to deliver and what's going on in the code. I can represent my reality on the board every day through sticky refactoring. If there's issues, we can represent those issues. We as a team can come together and solve them. Second principle, honesty is accuracy. If I can see the issue, I can manage the issue. You know, I, I need to be delivering with my guys. I need to see there's a problem. I need to get into it, fix it, and carry on. And the third principle, love your technical debt. Because by loving it, you care about it. And when you care about something, you make sure it's taken care of. And there's a picture of our board. Each of these little orange stickies is the various responsibility. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Any questions, any comments? I mean, I'm good. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, you changed your direction on the board. Yes. So what's the benefit you saw when you did that? Well, initially, the team's more engaged because they're not just this automated rut. You know, they've got to be a little bit more alert around what's actually happening on the board because it's different. Now, who moved my cheese? What's going on? Yeah, and then, then, then you actually, then, once that's settled in, you're starting with the most important thing because we naturally want to move left to right because we lead, read left to right. So you know, it's, it's bringing it to front of mind. It's the beginning of conversation. Uh, and it's just it's a little bit more fluid conversation. Well, you, know, you know what's actually been achieved. You, you know as soon as you look at the board, that's what we got through yesterday. You know, it's not what needs to be done. You're looking at it from a success criteria. And, and neurologically, it feels a little bit more like a pull, like you're actually pulling, like you should be pulling from column to column. OK, we've we'll got a question over here. To me. Which is more a comment on what you've just said. It's, it's hugely important to focus on the right side of the glass and keep motivated. In other words, what I picked up from that, it goes to, I'm seeing I was successful today, whereas how often we, we sit and look at Oh gee, I still got this to do. And it's that mindset that puts you in a can do attitude. It, it's in fact hugely important psychologically for, for success. Just that simple technique. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's all about a positive mental attitude, you know? Thanks. Is Any it? other questions, comments? Right. Yes. So everyone on my team is taking the SCARF assessment. I know if Brendan's talking to me and he's annoying me that I need to reframe his engagement with me. It's not that he's trying to annoy me. It's that he, he's got a high relatedness driver going on. So I will give him time and attention to focus on the issue that he's discussing. And then I can calmly proceed back to my work. So I'm not subjected to a amygdala hijack. I'm not polluting my team's efficiency. All right, I think we'll leave it there. One more time, please, a round of applause for uh, Travis. Right, change.